back to part four of 10 in our Jesus Trip series on contemplation. You'll remember I'm just taking nuggets here from our full 20-hour extended e-course on contemplation, which you can find at johncrowder.net. Now, many of you will want to check it out, and don't just binge watch it. Take your time with that course. Engage in practice along the way. And even with these shorter, free Jesus Trip series videos I'm putting out, go back and watch these in order this, this mini-series, it's all on our YouTube page. Look, contemplation itself is not just a sterile intellectual exercise. This is love and adoration. In the Western world, we believe the mind does the thinking and the heart does the feeling. But there's a non-duality. Unlike mental prayer with words, contemplation is more embodied, more somatic, the felt or immediate presence of God. And it's always presence and never absence. And it is foremost intimate. And this embodiment aspect tends to reverberate and spill out in every area of life. The mystic realizes we move heart first. It's from the heart that the mind is ultimately informed. I guarantee many of you felt the truth of the gospel in your heart long before your offended mind caught up to it. The 19th century mystic Theophan the Recluse said, God should be with you like a toothache. Great name for a saint, huh? Theophan the Recluse. Out here on the farm with my two miniature goats and miniature donkeys, I've become Crowder the Recluse. Anyway, Cynthia Bourgeau, she says that we might have preferred a different metaphor, but this picture of the toothache does speak forcefully to the fact that our, quote, concept of God is sensate. Remembrance of God is not a mental concept. It exists deeply embodied. That's a vibration, a homing frequency to which we can become increasingly sensitively attuned. It's walking in the spirit, being aware, cognizant of his abiding presence in that inner dynamic which resonates beyond words. No one can drum up walking in the spirit. That's something we can only sink back into. We learn to allow the spirit to carry us. We taste and see that the Lord is good, and this changes our minds and our behavior follows. Now, as we've gone forward with our series, I've slowly begun to define contemplation. Some people think it's just not talking, and they miss the transformative spiritual elements to the practice. One thing is not optional. If we do not learn to pull aside amidst the constant noise and instant gratification of this world, and find the deeper, infinite joy of the one who is less than a breath away in the very solitude of our own being, we simply will not survive the onslaught and chaos of this world's noisy but shallow madness. Karl Rahner, the great Catholic theologian, famously said, the Christian of the future will be a mystic or will not exist. So to contemplate means to gaze. Contemplatio in Latin, theoria in Greek. It is the Christian practice of looking at, gazing at, being aware of God. This doesn't happen uniquely in silent prayer alone, but it's the heartbeat of it. It's the culmination of all worship and devotion, just being with God, abiding, without any extraneous commentary, any inner intimate knowing and being known. You, you could roll that in as, as being contemplation. If my people would only acknowledge me, says the Lord. All prayer, in fact, the very purpose of your life is summed up and looking at God in love. Christ is both the word of God and the silence that stands between all words. He is, in fact, beyond silence, as Isaac the Syrian prays in this beautiful prayer. Quote, O mystery exalted beyond every word and beyond silence, who became human in order to renew us by means of your voluntary union with the flesh. Reveal to me the path by which I may be raised up to your mysteries, traveling along a course that is clear and tranquil, free from the illusions of this world. Gather my mind into the silence of prayer so that wandering thoughts may be silenced within me during that luminous converse of supplication and mystery-filled wonder. Guys, we all crave his silence. And yet it's not as simple as just shutting up and doing it, or we'd all be doing that already. 
He has guidance for us. There are ancient paths, saints and mystics and good shepherds who've navigated these waters to help us with the hang-ups and frustrations that we think are limited only to us. You say, well, for some reason, silence is difficult for me. Again, welcome to the club. But in the light of grace, we realize God's silence is our very home, where words are not necessary in that embrace of his all-knowing and endlessly caring love and mercy. There are some practical tools to help us. Many of you are coming from different degrees of experience in your contemplative journey. So I'm catering this series in a way that attempts to provide helpful spiritual direction for everybody, to the one who may not even really know what contemplation is. Over the next few sessions, we're going to look at simple, accessible entry tools and simple disciplines to get you started. We don't like that word discipline, but we'll come back to that. And for those of you a little further down the road who've already developed a more consistent practice of silent prayer, I'm giving some language to some of the deeper interior dynamics that you're encountering along the way. But to drill down with some tools, some practical applications, to use the word disciplines, to even suggest that there are transformative aspects to this practice, well, that's going to get some people's fur raised on end. And that's why I'm calling this session the grace of contemplation. See, if we view contemplation as a work, we're looking at it all wrong. You're literally saying that rest is a work? This is not some add-on to the gospel. No more than theology is an add-on to the gospel. Could you perceive it that way? Sure, plenty of people do. And I have plenty of friends who are gracists who view everything through this black and white filter of grace versus works. Look, grace has to be drunk straight. No water, no ice, surely no ginger ale. But theology is not an add-on. It's a means of helping us understand the gospel of grace. Contemplation is not an add-on. It's our very means of engagement with Mr. Grace. I mean, if I just myopically view everything as a work and therefore bad, well, don't breathe, that's a work. Don't pray, that's a work. Don't preach, that's a work. And whatever you do, don't actually go to work because that's a work. The only problem with works is when we view them in a salvific sense as an add-on to his finished work. But like Paul, the apostle of grace, who outworked everybody else, grace actually empowers a more productive life because the performance orientation is out of the way. The real issue here is one of performance orientation. And unlike verbal prayer, unlike mental prayer, contemplation is one of the very keys to obliterating our performance orientation. It's the purest form of prayer because it is pure repose, not struggle. It is the act of drinking pure grace. It is awareness of our union. Nobody's making you do this, forcing you to sit down and enjoy Jesus. But part of the reason the Western church is so mechanical, cerebral, dry, why its spiritual senses are so dull, why it's so exhausted, well, obviously because many are clueless about their union with Jesus, which is the gospel, but it's also because people are never taught how to pray. Prayer is presented as this thing you do, this babbling production of asking God for stuff he already knows you need, mostly he's already done, telling him stuff that he already knows. We're running ragged in a, in a world full of busyness, noise, and our own interior lives are full of constant chatter and inner dialogues, and we're veritably starving for silence. Silence is a very grace to us. But if some of the tools, the concepts that I present to you in this series are not particularly helpful for you at this moment, just glean what is helpful for you now. Some of it may seem irrelevant for your current place in life. However, carving out regular moments of silence and solitude really is not optional. It's possible some of the concepts that I'm presenting here might make more sense to you 10 years down the road. So wherever you are in your journey, just be patient with yourself. Your exploration is your own. So don't think in terms of right and wrong ways of doing things. We indeed grow along the way, but contemplation is not about stages or levels. So we must dispel with those kind of notions from the start. Otherwise, it becomes about acquiring or arrival. And in today's society of Western consumerism, which has unfortunately infiltrated the church, we are prone to view spirituality as something to be mastered or commodified, and contemplation is just not another spiritual gadget to be added to your tool belt. No, contemplation is ultimately relationship. It's about engaging with the one, 
who's always been closer to you than your very breath, the, the one who inhabits the very silence we run from with our smartphones, Netflix, Facebook, TikTok. There's no arrival, no ladder to be climbed, no esoteric discipline to be mastered. This is about a mode of being, an ancient mode of being, of truly being a human being, engaging with what already is and always was, though we attempt to fill every empty space, every moment of quiet with noise, to avoid the deafening silence of his presence that speaks deeper than any word. We're learning to, as Bonaventure said, to engage with the one whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. So as we start transitioning to tools, to contemplative practice, what is practice? How does this work? Most of us aren't monks, but there is something about pulling aside and cultivating a time of refreshing quietude. You've got kids, you've got jobs, but there's a way to take the courageous step of carving out some solitude. If you don't already have an established contemplative practice, I'd encourage you to actually start allowing yourself time of real silence, not verbal prayers, not hill songs. It's not about the clock, but if you start in increments, you may find yourself going 15, 20, 30 minutes a day or more. Curiously, it becomes addictive. I'm talking about complete silence. That might not be normal for you or may feel strange. You may wonder if you're doing it right, doesn't matter. It may even be difficult, even awkward. Because stuff will pop up to the surface when you sit for that long, especially if you aren't used to it. Memories, trauma, to-do list. And that's one of the reasons we avoid silence. And if you're here today, you either appreciate silence, or at least the idea of it, but deep down inside of you, you know that you're in dire need for it. For some of you, silence may be a love that you lost a long way back. And you're hoping to find that love rekindle. Just remember, although I'm giving you ancient tools... This is an exercise in grace. It's not an internal climbing toward God, but it is a remembrance and a release into the realization that you are in God. He is in you at a level that runs deeper than the intellect. And in contemplation, you harmonize with him as an echo of who he himself is. And thus contemplation runs beyond your 20 or 30 minutes of silent practice. It becomes a mode of being. In a sense, it cannot even be taught or defined. You can't just chart out a schematic definition of what the practice of the presence of God actually is. But we can still use words to throw at this mystery. And one of the fellows that does it most beautifully is Thomas Merton, who writes, Contemplation is the highest expression of our intellectual and spiritual life. It is that life itself, fully awake, fully active, fully aware that it is alive. It is spiritual wonder. It is spontaneous awe at the sacredness of life, of being. It is gratitude for life, for awareness, and for being. It is a vivid realization of the fact that life and being in us proceed from an invisible, transcendent, and infinitely abundant source. Contemplation is, above all, awareness of the reality of that source. It knows that source, obscurely, inexplicably, but with a certitude that goes beyond reason and beyond simple faith. For contemplation is a kind of spiritual vision to which both reason and faith aspire by their very nature, because without it, they must always remain incomplete. Yet contemplation is not vision because it sees without seeing and knows without knowing. It is more profound depth of faith, knowledge too deep to be grasped in images, in words, or even in clear concepts. It can be suggested by words, by symbols. But in the very moment of trying to indicate what it knows, the contemplative mind takes back what it has said and denies what it had affirmed. For in contemplation, we know by unknowing, or better, we know beyond all knowing or unknowing. Again, Merton writes this, Contemplation is also the response to a call, a call from him who has no voice and yet who speaks in everything that is, and who most of all speaks in the depths of our own being, for we ourselves are words of his. But we are words that are meant to respond to him, to answer to him, to echo him, and even in some way to contain him and signify him. Contemplation is this echo. Guys, you may not realize how many of the church fathers Merton is summarizing here in such a poetic way. 
Now, although I'm going to be giving you some tools for practice in upcoming sessions, because there are tools, do not mistake any form of practice for this most important fact, what contemplation truly is. It's relationship, not just an accumulation of mental exercises. Now, at first, the tools will be important for you in cultivating some simple discipline. But eventually, you will not think about the tools. We don't throw away the tools. They're just there as fencing to help us maintain our gaze. This is relationship, not methodology. God's presence in silence is not something to be attained or acquired through any practice. Therefore, contemplation is a gift that's already been given to us, which we are learning to explore. Uh, Carl McCollman says, silence is a gift of grace that is given to all of us, and we are invited into that when we enter into this place of wordless prayer. And Vincent Pizzuto says, the summit of the Christian life is the fullness of life in Christ, a fullness that cannot be obtained by our own efforts, only accepted as a given. It cannot be achieved, only received as pure gift, pure grace. Thus, the contemplative life it's not simply about adopting meditative methods and techniques, but about entering into an interior silence that deepens our relationship with the triune God who dwells within. Now, especially as a beginner, but also even as a regular practitioner, one of the first things you'll notice as you're praying is that you are praying. And then you'll try not to think about the fact that you're praying. And then you get frustrated because the more you try not to notice it, the more you do notice it. And then we think about the clock. This is completely normal. It's okay. We're working at relaxing here. As St. Paul says, striving to enter the rest. So let your thoughts do what they're going to do. Again, we aren't chasing thoughts or trying to do a mind over matter trick here. We gently, calmly accept what's going on, allow ourselves to let go, and just let that stuff pass by. Allowing ourselves the liberty not to analyze every thought that passes by. We're handing it over to the Lord and just sinking deeper. And there's so much grace because it, it's like a massage. We don't even realize we're carrying all this pressure and there's this tension. But then when the masseuse finally releases that knot, boom, something happens. But when we sit down, we aren't trying to make something happen. We sit with no expectations. Listen, zero expectations. This isn't a hyped up revival event. We aren't going for light shows and visits to heaven and smoke and all this, especially not make-believe, okay? We are sinking into the gentle presence of God and allowing ourselves to be enveloped in a union that is deeper to us than we are to our own selves. And stuff is happening, even and especially when we don't realize stuff is happening below the surface. We aren't just here for a product or the benefits or the fruit. We are allowing not just our mind, but the gaze of our very heart to be captivated by the Trinity, which is already here, closer than we are to ourselves. Folks, we're not ascending. We're not gaining new levels or stages. That mentality is the very thing we're shedding. You are united to God in the very humanity of Jesus Christ. We begin, continue, and end all from a place of union with God in Jesus Christ. What's happening in contemplation is that the clutter of our thoughts that blind us to him begin to lift as we actually sit and give ourselves over to the silence. And I know this can be scary. There's a reason we fill all the silence in our life with noise and media and news and vain battle. We're afraid to see what's in there. We've got built-in reactions to things from childhood, but we aren't trying to dig around and do inner healing stuff right here. Despite our fears, what awaits us is actually a vast, endless chasm of divine love. The very thing we were running from was the very thing we desired and were made for. You aren't becoming holy through this. You already are in Jesus. What's happening is that the way of our being is learning to synchronize with the truth of our being at a place beyond mere intellectual agreement with theological truths. Because we're experiencing God, not just ideas about him. And experiencing God is infinitely beyond just what our emotional framework can comprehend either. So at times it's going to feel great. At other times you may feel frustrated. This is not a mental exercise or just emotionalism. Although our minds and emotions will become more ordered as we learn stillness, as we learn some degree of solitude in our lives. And even for those of you nursing mothers with toddlers and CEOs whose phones are always blowing up, there is a way to carve out moments of solitude. 
It's not a luxury to be afforded. See, the truth is you actually can't live without this. And the insanity of this mad clown world we see around us, which has lost its mind, is actually the fruit of a humanity that has forgotten solitude. We've untethered from the anchor, not realizing that he has never untethered himself from us. If we can just learn to press pause from time to time. God doesn't want your quiet time. He wants your time. The goal is a life of awareness of his presence. Yet without those intentional moments of pulling away from everything else, we quickly find ourselves numbed in our sensitivity to him. So we aren't shadow boxing this illusory false self in order to apprehend the God who has already apprehended us in Jesus. You have been drawn up into the ineffable wonder of the Son's own perfect knowledge of the Father. And this knowledge consists not of mere information, but communion. The Spirit reveals this inexhaustible love to us, deafening us to the lie that silence is separation. The Spirit speaks not with many words, but the Word, whose speech is embrace and whose embrace is embodied quietude. This is the very silence from which we've run, trying to fill it up with fistfuls of sand thrown into an endless sea. Silence is not a chasm of absence. It's an eternal cistern of presence. We've forgotten ourselves because we're starved for true contemplation, missing the very one who fills all things in every way. It is in silence that we come face to face with so much of our delusional thinking, and we begin to realize it for what it is, as powerless. It only thrived on our own belief in its lies, the lies that we aren't loved, the lies that keep us scrambling with busyness to escape some false sense of shame or insecurity, concocting shallow, vain, hypocritical self-images to, to earn love, to earn approval. But we're embraced in a sense of love that disempowers all this delusion. Contemplation is communion that dispels all of this because contemplation is just the mode of our participation in the gospel truth of Jesus Christ, gazing upon the one who tells us who we really are. God is not relegated only to our prayer closet. You are a prayer. Your whole life is an incense, a fragrant aroma of Christ unto God. Whether you're mowing the lawn or doing taxes, there's no disembodied spirituality. Jesus is not just your spiritual life. He's your life. Yet there is still something of learning and some detachment of pulling aside so that we're more centered in that earthly life and not just thrown around in it by every thought, every worry, every care, having to form an opinion on every political argument on Twitter without a grounding and an anchor of presence. In this place of silence, we get grounded in a sense of love that transcends all thought and a peace that surpasses understanding. It's cultivated within us. So contemplation is walking your dog, it's going fishing, it's working in your garden. For Brother Lawrence, it was washing the dishes. So the practical prayer tools that I'll be starting with next week are not an exclusion to that stuff, okay, to our active life. The first discipline we'll actually cover is just carving out a space and time for some silent detachment, for just being with him alone. And ironically, it'll help you to recognize him all the more in those other daily, even mundane activities. Jesus had a very active earthly life, eating, drinking with his disciples, doing stuff. But he also pulled aside for contemplation and centering with the Father, which was the hub out of which his entire life operated. So there's no true Christianity apart from contemplation. Eugene Peterson said the contemplative life is not a special kind of life. It is the Christian life. Nothing more, but also nothing less, but lived. We've got some fun in-person gatherings coming to a region near you in 2024. So before you go, let me tell you where I'm headed. I'll be in Albuquerque, New Mexico in August. I'll be in New England coming to Massachusetts in October. In November, I'll be with Dr. C. Baxter Kruger in Germany as well as in Switzerland. And I'll be in Middle America in Ohio in December. Check it out, johncrowder.net. 
check out our monthly live web conference platform, The Inner Sanctum, at thenewmystics.tv. It's where I give live, full-length lectures, interactive Q&A sessions, plus you have hundreds of hours of archived teaching, Bible commentary found nowhere else. And your small membership fee helps support our orphanages and missions around the world. So it's a win-win. Finally, please visit our main site, johncrowder.net, where you can find upcoming events like this ministry cruise to Alaska, September 2024, with myself and Dr. C. Baxter Kruger. You'll find our extended on-demand e-courses, like this 20-hour module on Christology. We've also got 20 hours just on contemplation. A really fun one, Drunk Church History. It's about 30 hours long. And our most recent on the book of Revelation that will change everything you thought about the apocalypse. So visit the page and you'll see we also have our longest e-course to date coming up live this summer, 2024, with myself, Dr. Baxter Kruger, Rod Williams. We're spending three whole months on Holy Spirit. And for those taking the online course, at the end of those 12 weeks, we will have an optional in-person activation gathering in Florida that is absolutely going to explode. Find everything at johncrowder.net. Plunge into the depths of the gospel of grace and sign up for Cana New Wine Seminary. Explore the heart of the Trinity, the ancient faith, the finished work of the cross. It's supernatural and presence-oriented. The online format makes it an extremely affordable theology course, and it's a rare opportunity to drink from some amazing teachers once a week. Catch the early bird discount rate at cana.co. Holy Spirit is often referred as the third person of the Trinity. But is the Trinity a hierarchy? Is Holy Spirit truly God? In a recent poll among 3,000 evangelicals, the majority believed Holy Spirit is a force, not a person. Yet the early church adamantly declared that Holy Spirit is the Lord, the giver of life, who spoke by the prophets and who is worshipped and adored together with Father and the Son. Many charismatics, though open to the Spirit's interaction, likewise think of Holy Spirit as a power or energy which comes in degrees. Holy Spirit doesn't come in portions. Holy Spirit comes in person. What does it mean that Holy Spirit has already been poured out on all flesh? Holy Spirit is hovering over humanity, pointing us to Christ, who reveals the Father. For a truly Trinitarian grasp of Holy Spirit that is both theological and deeply experiential, we would like to invite you this summer for a three-month extended online e-course with myself, John Crowder, together with C. Baxter Kruger and Rod Williams, exploring the often neglected person of the Godhead, Holy Spirit. Each week, we'll gather online for live, interactive discussions with students and participants June through August 2024. Live sessions are time zone friendly for the USA, the UK, and Europe. At the end of the course, we will cap it off with an optional in-person gathering on the Emerald Coast of Florida with Warren Sylvester leading worship. Holy Spirit is illuminating and making the reality of our union with God known to us in superabounding wonder. After 12 weeks of deep teaching on Holy Spirit, this in-person gathering is about tangible impartation as we come together to experience a deeper divine reality than words can express. Find out more about the course as well as the impartation weekend and take advantage of the early bird discount at johncrowder.net slash spirit.